Hello, Jose Rodriguez here. Again, it is a very, very chilly and extremely windy day outside, so might as well come down to the dungeon and proceed to finally do this long video. We're going to talk about this puppy right here. As you can see, I have stuff laying on top of it. As long as you're very careful, you're not going to really cause any problems. I really just don't have enough surface area here for everything. So let's go ahead and remove this just for the time being. Here is my nice 3D printer bottle holder that a viewer made for me. Yes, all sorts of things can be done with other types of printers. One of these days, I'm going to get into this aspect of printing. We're going to be exploring 3D printing as well. But not for this video. This is all about the Pro 1000. As you can see, a couple of purge sheets here. I've been running these pretty much every couple of days just to keep the nozzles nice and clean. Now, this is one heck of a printer. I would not really recommend this to anyone, okay, unless you are a semi-professional photographer who requires the ability to print images of this caliber and produce prints that are going to be displayed in places even if you're a drone flyer like I am, I shot this from one of my drones. Basically, it's just a shot of my street from about 100 feet up in the air. And um, yeah, something like this will produce really majestic results. But it's a very demanding printer. But let me just give you a couple of quick specifications about this Canon Pro 1000. It is able to print a multitude of different standard sizes just like any other printer would. 17 by 22 is the standard maximum cut paper size, although you could create a custom paper size 17 by 25.6, almost 26 inches long. And again, you would have to then cut a piece of paper to that size or dimensions from a roll and then feed it from the top feeder or the rear feeder and hope for the best, but you would have to create a custom size. Now, before we get too deeply into this, a new firmware has been issued, and I was a little bit leery about actually installing it because I didn't know whether that might cause problems with the current set of chips that I am running on this printer, which are the Precision Colors chips that they were selling from China, so-called auto reset chips, which turned out to not be auto reset chips at all. Simply, all they do is allow you to use them once, unfortunately. Well, I was a little leery about going ahead and installing that firmware because it may disable the use of those chips. You never know. But the amazing thing is that Canon decided, I guess because of the demand from owners, that they would increase the maximum length so they went ahead and created this firmware, which does indeed increase the length that you can now print with up to like 47 inches long. So 17 by 47, that's a pretty darn good panorama. And so we're going to go ahead. I finally decided, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. It'll be done this week, maybe next week. I don't know. It just depends on my time. I need a really good block of time to do this properly, install it properly, because there is a process to this. And then we'll report on it, whether it, it disables the ability to use third-party chips. I hope it does not. Or does it actually provide you with the ability to print longer panoramas, which at this point, it really does not. Okay. It can handle all types of media. I don't care what you throw at this. It will process it correctly. Again, it's a wonderful printer. The fitting mechanism is very good. One of the best that I have come across so far. So yeah, you can print on glossy, semi-gloss, luster, satin, every kind of matte surface you can think of, including watercolor. I got a gigantic watercolor print right here that I did on Canson real watercolor paper, not inkjet coated paper. And uh, these are available for anyone that's interested. They were of a uh, Annapolis cafe outside and I turned it into a painting, which then lends itself wonderfully to be printed onto watercolor paper. But that's another story. So anyway, yes, you can print on anything, including canvas as well. Well, most people like to print on canvas and then do a canvas wrap. 
So you can do that easily with this printer. You're limited, however, to the 17 inch width. So you're gonna end up with maybe about a 15 inch wide canvas by whatever length, especially if you install that new firmware, you might be able to print longer than 22 or 25 inches. So again, all medias work perfectly on this printer. The ink palette, 11 colors plus chroma optimizer. So that makes it 12 cartridges that you have to begin to realize that you're going to have to be buying regularly, okay, at $60 each. So that's an expense right there. Again, the capabilities of this printer are amazing, but the cost, operating cost, basically is a lot higher than even the other Canon printers, even the Pro 1 which uses 12 cartridges as well. So again, something to consider. It does have a proprietary red. It's not the same red that everyone else might use. It is specifically designed for this printer. And of course, something most other printers do not have any longer, a blue, a proprietary blue. And that allows you to then print images that contain certain tones, certain colors that require basically a more pure level of blue ink. You no longer have to composite a blue color by mixing cyan and magenta. You don't have to do that any longer because you have a proprietary blue included into the ink set. And that's wonderful. And I have done demonstrations where I can uh, bring out certain blues that normally would not be able to be printed on the P800 or the Pro 1 even, or the Pro 10 whatsoever. They just simply will not be able to be printed. And so having that extra blue really makes a difference. Now, when you print with matte media on the Pro 1 and the Pro 10, it will not use matte black ink. Imagine that. I, I know it's mind boggling. It will not use matte black ink. So your density of your dark tones will never reach the proper level of DMAX, they call it. So what do you have to do? Well, the way the driver works is you have to choose fine art media, okay? And when you choose fine art media and choose a matte paper within that category, now it makes you load the paper through the manual feeder in the rear. And that's okay, but it imposes a 35 millimeter border leading and trailing edge. What if you don't want that? Well, if your print has, is, is something that you might want a 35 millimeter border all around, then yeah, you can probably crop that image and make it fit so that it takes into account that wide leading and trailing edge border. There's no way you can avoid that. It's going to ask you to do that because it's the only way that you can then trigger the printer to use matte black ink. You have to choose fine art media. Okay. That's on the Pro 1 and that's on the Pro 10. But not on this one. Not on this one at all. Okay. I can load just photo matte paper and it will print on matte black ink. But it's going to ask me to load it from the back. It's still going to ask me to do that. And so it, once you do that, it's going to then impose that border. But there's a way to disable that in the driver where you tell it specifically by clicking on a little tick box to just ignore that. And it will do that, which is awesome. Now I can print with, say, a quarter inch border, if I so wish, on a 17 by 22 printed on matte paper or that watercolor paper that I just showed you. I no longer have to accept those wide borders, leading and trailing edges. Okay. Easy place to click. I'll show you how to do that in some video. In fact, I think I've already done that. And so again, it's found in the driver. I think it's the page setup tab. Okay. Auto cleaning cycles. There's a function right here. I'm going to find it for you. I'm not going to show you exactly because it's really unnecessary. You go all the way down to various settings and click on that. Device settings. 
all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. Auto maintenance settings is going to be right after the quiet settings. It's going to be called auto maintenance settings. You click on that and it says auto nozzle check. It says system cleaning frequency. Ink maintenance tank is installed. It just says that I have a maintenance cartridge installed in the printer. We're going to click on the auto nozzle check. It allows you to enable it which I just did, and disable it, which you should not do. I will explain why. Let me go back. System cleaning frequency. You have standard and you have short. There is no none. You cannot disable that. So I picked short, which is basically less cleaning cycle, in other words. I assume, I really don't know exactly what that means, because again, it was translated from the original language of the manufacturer. So standard, short, I don't know what that means. I, I rely on the term frequency, which means how often does it do something? So I assume it has something to do with that. So I picked short and I left the auto nozzle check enabled. Why did I do that? Okay, I will explain why and why you should also do that as well. The reason you want to do that is because unlike an Epson printer, at least a P800, I don't know whether that technology actually exists internally or, or not. If I say print every other day or so, that's pretty often, uh, it will just immediately start printing. Now, I may have some nozzles that are clogged. Okay, who knows? For whatever the reason. But I don't believe that that printer or any of my other older Epson printers has the ability to detect that a nozzle is clogged, okay, to begin with, before it starts to do anything. Apparently, this does. So that's why you want to leave that on, okay? You want to allow it to be able to detect nozzles that are clogged. Auto nozzle check. Doesn't mean that it's going to run a nozzle check for you, a print. It's going to detect and then require a cleaning cycle to be conducted prior to printing, even if you already are within that window of 60 hours. Okay? That's very important. So it will never start printing a given job, if you will, if it feels and it has detected that it shouldn't be printing because there's a couple of nozzles that are clogged. Now, also, what it might also be doing, and again, I'm no expert. I read as much as I can about this. I go to places where no one really goes to to find out things about this printer. The printhead has redundant nozzles, meaning extra nozzles that are not being used until they need to be used. So this auto nozzle check may be doing one of two things. It may be telling the printer, hey, run a nozzle cleaning. Or it may say, hey, these two nozzles are kaput. Allow the other two adjacent nozzles to take over. So automatically it is assigning a different path to two so-called redundant nozzles. Now here's the catch. Once all of your redundant nozzles are used in one particular channel, one of those 12 channels, even though the other channels may still have many nozzles available, the printhead is gone. You have to replace the printhead because it has used up all of the available redundant nozzles in say cyan or photo cyan or yellow, whatever the case may be. So that is a good feature. Again, you won't even notice it is doing it in the background for you. So that's really a good feature to have. I often print on my P800, my other Epson models, and I will have banding on my print because I did not run a nozzle check prior to beginning to print that job. I should have run a nozzle check, detected that indeed I better do a cleaning cycle, okay? And so if I had done that and then run a secondary nozzle check prior to me sending that important job, such as one of these prints right here, then I would have known that either, yes, I cleared out any problems that it had by conducting that cleaning cycle, and then a secondary nozzle check to ensure that I visually can see I'm ready to go. 100% of my nozzles are firing. 
Epsons do not have redundant nozzles. You have a finite number of nozzles, period. You better take care of those really, really well. Okay, so don't mess with that setting. Auto nozzle check, leave it on. When you feed paper that may be a little bit heavier than normal, in most mechanical transport systems <clears throat> on printers that you can use at home, let's just say um, something like this, maybe not the 2000, that's, that's a more professional unit, but any of the desktop models that can sit on a rack, for instance, do not have vacuum advance so that the head does not literally physically strike, say, the edge of the paper as it is entering, beginning to make a printing pass. So that's a good thing to have. Again, a feature not found on any of my other printers. Okay, This puppy here comes with features installed that are only seen in your extremely more expensive models, higher end models. Yes, as well as Epson. Okay, None of the so-called prosumer level printers have vacuum assisted advance. You will hear it come on. You will hear it come on. It'll just be a, a, a mild noise, sort of like air. Okay, that's what it is. It's sucking air. So, and that will keep your paper nice and flat during your print job. Basically, that's all it's doing. It's not assisting in the transportation of the paper, but just keeping it flat. So you don't end up with head strikes. Now, if you don't use the printer for a while and you begin to send the print job to it, it may catch you by surprise that you hear this pumping action. It's, a weird, it's not a cleaning cycle. It's more like a pumping action. And you have to wonder, what, is, what are you doing? You know, what, what? another noise. Oh, my gosh. Another one of your weird noises that you're performing here. What, are, what is it you're doing? It's performing an internal agitation process. And that is to bring the, remember, Remember, as I have said in the past, there are internal ink compartments inside this printer, okay? And I'll sort of touch in, on, onto that later on. This is gonna be long, I warned you guys. So that internal compartment holds ink, not the ink in the cartridges. That is further inward, okay? So that compartment holds ink. Think of it as a, as a little tank, like a toilet tank that holds water temporarily. We'll get into that analogy later as well. So that ink is sitting there. And remember, this is pigment ink. So there are pigment particles. And what do particles do? I don't care how neutrally buoyant they are. They can settle. Okay, Eventually, they will settle. So the pumping action is simply a little piston system built into each one of those containers. Okay, And it's just simply pumping ink in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And it's just re-agitating it and bringing it to the normal suspended condition. Why do you want to do that? Well, the last thing you want, like I said in a previous video, is to have ink density change depending on the level. In other words, the upper level is weak. The center level might be normal, but the lower level is way too strong. What does that mean? As far as print quality, you'll get a huge color cast, okay, if you print with that unagitated ink. So that's why it's performing that action. And again, another feature not found anywhere else except here and above. You can create custom, let me read it here correctly, custom paper or media configurations that will appear actually appear this is the awesome thing it will appear in your drivers paper or media drop down menu it will not just be canon so and so okay it'll be whatever paper you configured to the printer and you need to use the media configuration tool that is a whole subject altogether we can spend hours discussing that and demonstrating that i have done a few videos but there are a lot better videos on youtube that describe it much better than I can. And again, this has been around for quite a while. Most of the IPF printers from Canon have that ability and they can actually use that tool, which is just a piece of software that you download and install so that you can then print on, say, Canson watercolor paper, 
create a configuration setting, meaning ink density, paper thickness, all of the parameters that make up this particular media. It requires matte black ink, all of that. And then it saves it as a paper choice that you actually name to indicate that is indeed that paper. It will pop up as that paper. And when you load it, all of these settings for, again, what? That paper will be loaded and your printer will be set correctly. I don't have to use a similar matte paper setting. That matte paper setting might be thinner, might require more or less ink density. You see what I'm saying? So it's a great thing to have, okay? What if you are a person who are actually trying to sell your prints generated by this printer? And you want to know, well, I have no clue how much money I am using in the creation of my prints, or gosh, how much money I'm losing in all of those cleaning cycles this printer runs every 60 hours or so. You have no clue. Well, the accounting software or the accounting manager, as it is called, you can download that and install it and it will find this printer. Then you have to do a little bit of work. You have to then basically program it to identify each one of these cartridges, how much they cost, okay? And if you're refilling, that's another set of math problems you have to deal with. But basically, you just install the, or, or program it with each cost per cartridge. In the case of Chrome Optimizer, it's a few dollars less than the colored ones. And then every single type of paper you use, you have to enter the name and price. So what happens then is if I run a job of say three 13 by 19s with, you know, polar luster from Red River, it will then figure out how much ink it used, add it to the cost of the paper per sheet and give me a total cost. That is the net cost. Now, if it runs a cleaning cycle prior to that, that will not be included in that particular cost. So the only way that you can basically integrate any of those cleaning cycle costs, because you did use ink, right? And that's ink that was never used for the creation of prints. It was literally, I don't want to use the word wasted because it was used for a process that they re, you know, the printer requires, but it still costs money. So the only way to figure that out, there is one setting. And again, I already did a video on that, demonstrating that. And it will just kind of give you a total of all of the ink used. So you will know you use so much ink for print production. And then the balance of that total was used basically for cleaning cycles and other maintenance procedures that this printer will run. But again, at least it gives you a, to the fraction of a milliliter, how much ink did a job cost you, okay? Because you have entered, of course, the cost per cartridge. Now, keep in mind that that is not necessarily, this is really for the people who use OEM only, because supposedly once you use up your ink in one cartridge, you get rid of it and you get a new one. So you're really also paying for the cost of a new cartridge and then chip as well as the ink. So if you start to refill, then you're going to be recycling those cartridges. Now you're just going to enter the cost per milliliter of ink times 80. That's what the tank will hold, the cartridge will hold, and then recompute your, your settings. In other words, reprogram the accounting manager software. But again, no other system allows you to figure out your actual, ex almost exact. I mean, it's like I said, 0 0.00 of an ML. Yeah. All right, timed auto print head cycles. Oh gosh, do we really want to get into that? I covered that way much already. So basically every 60 hours, every 120 hours, every 240 hours and every 480 hours. And after that, there's no more timing. It'll just be a larger one. So, I mean, you could print today something, it runs a cleaning cycle. So then I have 60 hours to continue printing jobs. It will not be generating a cleaning cycle until I pass 60 hours again. If I decide not to print and I pass 120 hours, then it will run a bigger clean cycle because I waited longer time. A lot more to that 
Again, watch my previous videos on this subject. I really don't want to make this horrendously long by getting into that subject at this point. But again, just be aware that they are timed maintenance cycles and you cannot avoid them. You cannot delete them. You cannot disable them. You cannot do anything about it. It is there for a reason that I have very carefully explained in my previous video. So go back and look at those and you will be shown exactly why these cycles have to occur. Okay, after every print job, okay, say I print just one of these purge sheets and that's it, 40 seconds later or so, 30 to 40, 50, I don't know how long it is, nothing else comes through the queue to be printed. It will then perform a little print head purge and it's like, like a fraction of a milliliter total ink. And that is to make sure that the print head is kept prime without any air that could possibly infiltrate those nozzles. That nozzle plate contains all of those thousands of nozzles. You don't want air to infiltrate that. So it will push out just a tiny amount of ink, which accounts to like, I don't know, a fraction of a milliliter total among all 12 channels. Okay. Also, it will perform a perch pad purging. In other words, as you print, there is something called a wiper blade and that keeps the bottom plate basically clean so that gunk is not building up constantly, which will then be applied to the surface of your prints. And that gunk is deposited on the purge pad. You want that to go away. You don't want to have that print head then parked on top of that gunky purge pad, right? So it will perform a slight vacuum sucking away of that excess ink that is collected every time you print. Again, this is all about inkjet printers. They all do that, every one of them, regardless of who makes it, okay? Just be aware of that. And so that, unlike other printers, this guy right here, or girl right here, will clean that purge pad, will suck away any buildup before you print your next job. Isn't that wonderful? Do you want that? Of course you want that. You would be complaining till the cows came home. Oh, my prints have smudges on them and I just wasted a $10 sheet of paper. Well, if the printer is like this one, you will not have that problem because you begin with a clean purge pad. When that printhead detaches itself from that pad, the bottom plate is clean. Okay, so you want that to happen. Now, one of the things that you should not do with this printer because of that, because of that very thing, especially the, the first item I just discussed, which was the repriming of the printhead, every single print, every single print, okay? You don't want to use this printer to make 100 four by sixes. That's ridiculous because it will perform 100 little head primings. Yes, okay? It may not perform that purge pad cleaning because you're feeding continuously 100 prints in that one job, 100 copies, let's just say. So you don't want to use this printer for making multiple small prints because it adds up. Every time you run a little tiny four by six, it uses a tiny amount of ink to print it. And you might be using, proportionally speaking, a lot of a lot more ink to you know clear that head from any air. Whereas something huge like this, this might take five or six milliliters of ink. And I may be using maybe a quarter of a milliliter total ink to clear the print head. I used a lot more ink to prepare those large prints. So use this printer for relatively large prints, okay? That's, that will actually throw that, that ratio of volume of ink creating prints and volume of ink clearing that print head. Every single time you print just a single print or a hundred prints. A single print is one little head priming. A hundred prints is a hundred head primings. So don't use that printer for that type of job. Use something else, something that is cheaper to operate, not this puppy right here. Remember that the ink cartridges, they are not pressurized. The PA-100 uses a pressurization system. This is a very simple process. It is actually gravity fed. And remember that if I showed you one, I don't have one here with me, but I would show you, you would see that the ink kind of flows in a slight downstream or downgrade type travel, and it goes out the exit port. The 
Cartridges themselves are extremely simple. It's just a receptacle. It only has one out. That's it. So you might wonder, well, how does it vent itself? Because as ink is deployed to the printer, something has to replace that space. And again, it is air. But how does that air get in? By the extremely well-engineered ink spigot that enters the cartridge through its valve. Air can come in as ink goes out using the same spigot. So there are two different ports in there. Again, it's all incredibly well engineered. And so as ink leaves, air gets in and maintains the atmospheric pressure as neutral inside the printer. Not negative, not positive. Now, I said I was going to talk about the um, those internal compartments. So why do they exist? Why? Right. Why would they exist? Well, unlike other printers, especially Epson, which utilizes ink bags inside their cartridges, and then the external space is pressurized against that ink bag, a certain amount of pressure has to be generated as you are printing, okay? And that maintains the ink flow because it's not by gravity any longer on an Epson printer. It is actually pressurized. Not so here. So what happens is they, they don't need an ink bag. The ink measurement system, in other words, the way that the printer realizes or figures out exactly how much ink has passed, it knows exactly when 80 ml of ink have left that cartridge. Because downstream from that, it uses sensors to measure the ink flow. So the compartment that holds that ink basically works like this. Think of it, again, like a toilet tank. You flush the toilet, water fills it up, and a float device will start to move up, move up, move up, and a valve is closed, and no more water can flow in. So if I was to have a bit of a leak at the bottom, my little flapper valve, I've had that problem before, it starts to leak, the water level will start to drop a little bit. At some point, that float comes down and it reopens that valve and you hear water just rushing in slowly and then it just closes back up. The same thing happens inside those ink compartments. The ink compartments at this point right now, I'm not doing anything with the printer. They are all at the proper level. Okay, so I start a job. I start producing some, you know, 17 by 24 prints. So I'm using quite a bit of ink. When any one of those compartments reaches a certain drop in volume, a certain drop, what is that drop? No clue, a certain drop. A sensor will then see that, okay? Oh, you went past a certain point. I'm gonna tell the other valve to open up and allow ink to flow from my cartridge to then replenish that compartment up to the correct level. So it will replenish it, it will continue to go up. At some point, it'll stop replenishing. I'm printing. I am printing. So constantly, ink is leaving that compartment, okay? And it's constantly being replenished at intervals. As the ink levels drop, the sensor is triggered. It tells the valve to open, and ink is allowed to flow into that compartment. Why is it so intricate? Why do we want that? Well, guess what? When an Epson P800 or 3880 or 3800 cartridge is declared empty, it still has 10 milliliters of ink in it. When you think about the fact that ink is about a dollar per milliliter for Epson ink, that's $10 you're throwing down the toilet or the garbage. Okay, I aspirate that ink. That's why I buy a lot of empties. I get a lot of ink out of those cartridges. Anyway, not these. When these are declared empty, they are empty. They are totally empty. Why? Because of the accuracy of the way it measures ink flow into that compartment. It knows how much ink has gone out. Why? Because it knows how much ink it let in to bring it up to a certain level. It triggers it at, say, let's just say that if it drops five milliliters, it triggers the ink flow to begin again. So it knows that it then loaded five milliliters of ink back into the compartment. That's how it knows. So when the chip says, because the printer told the chip, hey, you're empty now. I'm about to draw the last milliliter of ink out of that cartridge. It declares the cartridge empty. The cartridge now is empty. 
If you're silly enough to then turn off ink monitoring at that point, you no longer have ink replenishing that internal compartment. You have air. So say you forget, and then you realize, oh my God, what did I do? Then you put a brand new cartridge in there. Well, that ink line preceding that compartment has nothing but air in it. So ink will start to flow again. As soon as you put a brand new cartridge with a brand new chip, the system will see it as full. The system will say, hey, my compartment is low. Please trigger that valve to open. It triggers that valve to open and ink just flows. The air might get into the compartment, but the compartment is vented to the atmosphere. So as ink is being brought in to replenish that level, air is vented out. You will never, ever, ever get air in your print head or air in your print head dampers, which you can easily do on an Epson printer, especially when using refillable carts. Okay. You can forget to top them off and you reset them. So the chip says, hey, I'm full, but the cartridge has no ink. It's just going to start flowing air in it. Eventually, that air will enter the printhead. You're in big trouble then. You see what I mean? So this printer will prevent you from doing that. And I'm sure that there are many other features. Oh, I forgot the most important one. Oh, how could I forget? Internal built-in. This alone should make this printer cost about $2,500. Densitometer. Okay. And what is that good for? It's not for creating profiles. For that, you would need a spectrophotometer, not a densitometer. What it does is when these come out of the factory assembly line, they're not all exactly identical outputs. Okay. They cannot be because they cannot reload these printers as they come out of the assembly line with inks and, that, and then test them. They're not about to do that. Imagine the waste of ink that would be generated because they would have to send it to you empty. You see what I mean? So they would waste a ton of ink. So they send them to you basically, do I dare say this, untested as far as color output. They sort of know that it's going to perform, but they don't know exactly how it's going to perform. So there will be a difference just like with car models. You know, there are certain parameters, certain uh, tolerances that are allowed in an assembly line type environment. The same thing happens with Pro 1000s, Pro 10s, Pro 1s, PA100s, whatever, P600s. They will all differ slightly. So these, say I had 10 of these, and I would have, say, one here, one at my friend's house, one at my cousin's, one at my uncle's, and so forth. And we start to kind of share profiles, let's just say. ICC profiles, they may not perform equally because the printer's output is not the same. It differs slightly, okay? So the job of the internal densitometer is to calibrate the printer internally so that its output, once you calibrate it, is at what the factory said it should be. And if my uncle does the same thing, then his will also be at the output that the factory says it should be. And my cousins and you guys, whoever running the internal calibration will do that for you. What will that do? Well, you have to access that here. And then what you do is you load, say, Pro Luster paper. And it will then run that for you. It will print a series of patches. The paper will never be ejected until it is done being calibrated on. So it will print a set of color patches. It will then spend some time drying it. It will then go back and as an internal sensor that, that densitometer will read those patches and will determine any possible output errors that took place with this printer, those inks, and that particular batch of paper. And then it will correct those. It will create a correction curve a lot, if you will, and then we'll then install that into the printer so that it will always apply that correction because it knows that without that, it's not outputting exactly the way the factory says it should be outputting. Okay, so everyone who does this will have the best output possible, first of all. But if I make a profile on my printer that I calibrated internally, and I send it to Jack Jones, 
across in Chicago, who also has a Pro 1000 that he also calibrated. His output will perfectly match my output using that one profile. Had he not calibrated his printer, my profile would not work as, as a match. In other words, if I use my profile for a paper, the output would not match his output on the same paper unless he calibrates that printer. Okay, so that is the reason for that internal calibration. And again, that is something not found on anything under a couple of grand, maybe even more. So that is it. There are more. I, like I said, I'm sure there are more things that I haven't even explored yet. And we're going to do that. Once I install that new firmware, we're going to come back and tackle making a panorama on this printer. We'll see how that works out. I have some 17 inch, 100 foot roll. Uh, so that I can cut some paper from. It should be a lot of fun. And again, it'll open up a brand new adventure for this Pro 1000, the ability to print past 22 inches or 25.6 inches. All right. I hope I didn't bore you too much. I hope this information was interesting enough. I hope you understood the way I was putting it out. Sometimes I have problems. Like I said, I learned English when I was 12. So, you know, what I know is what I know. So thank you so much for watching. I'm going to do a video next where I will tell you, at least try to tell you, why you might all of a sudden see certain colors not printing the way you think they should be printing, like yellows or, or reds or oranges or blues, because you see them on your monitor. Your monitor is calibrated. I'm not saying your monitor is not calibrated. But somehow, you know, that yellow just looks stronger in my monitor and not so on paper. We're going to talk about that. I will tell you my thoughts on that and why I think that might be occurring. So stay tuned. Again, don't forget to subscribe. Always share and like. That helps the channel. Happy printing, everybody. Don't be too discouraged with this baby right here. She is amazing. Bye-bye, everyone.